I've got a lot of ground to cover tonight, and again, I want to thank you for your loyalty. We've had some very sensational meetings over these last couple of months dealing with sexuality and so on that are very sensational subjects. And I know very well when we come down to the nitty gritty of discipline and disciplining children and so on that those kind of subjects are not as popular as the sensational ones. And I am absolutely thrilled to see the loyalty that so many of you have given to staying with the series through those bits that are sensational, yes, and also many of you coming even on a subject like this. I appreciate it very much. And I know on a freezing cold winter's evening, the disciplining of children is not the happiest of subjects. I discussed it with my girls at tea time. Rather interesting discussion it was as to what they thought about my approach to the subject for the past 16 years. I'll not tell you what they said because they made me promise not to and I wouldn't tell you anyway in that circumstance. But it's not a popular subject and it's not an easy subject and it's a very controversial subject. But it's very important couldn't be more important. And I hope long after this cold winter's evening is over, and long after this service is over, that what you learn from the Word will be able to help you when you become a parent and you have to start applying some of these principles. If you never become a parent, well, maybe you'll be able to pass the principles on to somebody who is and share it with them when they're having problems. But here are principles that are so important for the family and for family life. Now I'm gonna cover a lot of ground, so big deep breath, plunge in, stay with me, and I'm going to go with God's grace flat out for an hour. And I've really gotta move it. So if you see me getting away off track, just shout out loud, get back on track, Derek and I'll know what you mean. But I, I mean it seriously. I want to stay with the subject and try not to get off it, if at all possible, because there's all sorts of things we could say on it. Now let's first of all read some relevant scriptures. Consider the clarity with which the following scriptures outline a healthy parental attitude towards children. We'll go to 1 Timothy, first of all, please. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3 and verse number 4. And I'm reading from the New King James. 1 Timothy 3 and 4. Talking about an elder, he is one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of of the church of God. If a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Hebrews chapter 12. And I find this a very challenging verse, passage rather. Hebrews chapter 12. Just keep turning right and you'll come to Hebrews chapter 12. And verse number five. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us. 
and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? So you see, the writer takes the example of a father chastening his children, saying that God will do the same to you in your circumstance. Ephesians, please, and chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey, verse 1, your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, the book of Proverbs It's an amazing little book, and we'll not go through those verses at the moment. I want you to look them up towards the end of the service. But there are quite a lot of little proverbs there that we want to read later. A mother uh, turned up one day for Christian counseling. Utterly distracted by a rebellious 13-year-old child who was totally beyond her parental authority. She didn't know what on earth she was going to do with this child. He wouldn't come home until 2 a.m. in the morning And he deliberately disobeyed every single request that she made of him, 13 years of age. When asked if she would disclose the history of the child, she said yes. She could very clearly remember where it all started. Her son, note this, was less than three years old less than three years old. And she carried him to his room and placed him in his cot. And he didn't like it, so he spat in her face to demonstrate his usual bedtime attitude. She attempted very gently and carefully to explain to her little child the importance of not spitting in mummy's face. But her lecture was interrupted by another moist missile. This mother had been told that all confrontation could be resolved by love, by understanding, and by discussion. Now, dear, you shouldn't spit at mummy. It's not good to spit at mummy. It isn't good. Now, the reason why, well, where it went. She wiped her face, and she began again, at which point the youngster hit her with another well-aimed blast. This is three times now. She began, as you can understand, to get a little frustrated by this time, and she, uh, she shook him. Yes, she shook him. But not hard enough, not hard enough to throw off his aim with his next contribution. <laughs> what could she do then? Well, her philosophy offered no honorable solution to this embarrassing challenge. So she finally rushed from the room in utter exasperation, and her little conqueror spat on the back of the door as it shut. She lost, and he won. She said she had never had the upper hand with her child after that night. It was a wet evening indeed. We want to maintain in this pulpit this evening that the greatest social disaster of this century is the belief 
that abundant love makes discipline unnecessary. We want to maintain that the greatest social disaster of this century is the belief that abundant love makes discipline unnecessary. Consider the fact that this generation of young people in the Western world have enjoyed more of the so-called good life than any other comparable group in the history of the world. Now, you can define the good life in any way that you want, but the bottom line really is that the conclusion is the same. Our children have had more pleasure and more entertainment and better food and more leisure time and better education and better medicine and more material goods and more opportunities that have ever been known before in the history of the world. And yet, despite all of this, we have a huge problem of discipline in our schools and in our society and in our homes across the nation. Instead of all this uh, bringing exuberance and gratitude from young people, there has been an antagonism and I'm speaking generally now, a haughty contempt for the generation that worked hard to provide it all, particularly the generation after the war. Some people say, well, it's the hypocrisy of parents. Well, there's always been hypocrisy in the world in parents. Well, it's, it was the creation of the H-bomb and, and so on, or, or the restriction of free speech or, or racial injustice or whatever. Well, in a sense, the central cause, it seems to me, is not the H-bomb or racial injustice. The central problem is the turmoil among young people that comes and is found coming out of the tender years of childhood. I really believe that. The central cause of what is called the angry generation comes out of the tender years of childhood. Because particularly in the 1950-1970 generation of of parents coming out of the war and tough times and so forth and more prosperity and more money coming, parents made a great mistake. And I believe this. They didn't really set up a respect nor responsible behavior, respect for them as parents or insist on responsible behavior from their children. And it has reaped incredible consequences in our generation. James Dobson identifies five key elements which are paramount if you are going to have proper control of children. Five key elements, and I've listed them in your notes. These are very, very, very important. First of all, if you're going to have control of children in your home, you're going to have to develop respect for parents. That is a critical factor in child management of any kind. It is most important that a child respects his parents. Not for the purpose of the parents saying, oh, we've got egos that need fed, but because the child's relationship with his parents 
provides the basis for his attitude or her attitude towards all other people. A child's view of parental authority becomes the cornerstone of that child's later outlook on school authority, on the police authority, on the authority of the law, and the people with whom he will eventually live and work, and for society in general. A child's attitude to all authority of any form within the church or without it or within society and so on is based upon his own attitude to parental authority. The parent-child relationship is the first and the most important social interaction an infant will have. That's very important to understand even in the first five years of a child's life. An infant there will, will find even the flaws and the knots of the interaction between it and its parents can often be seen in a child's later relationships with other people. That's why this meeting tonight is very important. It is, in fact, one of the most important meetings in this series that I will have the privilege of taking. If young people who will be married, many of them within the next 10 years or just who have already got married and have their first children coming or whatever, can understand before those little ones enter their homes that the relationship between that child and you as a parent, even with its flaws and its knots, will be seen in later relationships that the child faces. I know that even in my own life. To this very day, my attitude, even to other people, is deeply influenced by my parents and what they thought and what they said and what they did. Amazingly so. Here is a child, and a child will not behave. Now, this is simplistic, but there is truth in this. Here is a child and it wants, wants to do something and its parent knows that it's going to be a real problem, it's, going, it's wrong, it's going to cause real heartache. And the child wants it and the mother says no. And then the child starts yelling. Yeah? So the mother uh, says, uh, oh, stop yelling, there's a sweet. And suddenly the child discovers that if it keeps yelling, pleasant things can happen. So it yells even more the next time. Next time the parent refuses something, the child screams. And then it gets something else just to keep it quiet. Yelling has paid a tasty dividend. And if that mother follows that pattern with that child for the next 14 years, I'll guarantee to you that ch that child will grow up expecting everybody to yield to his or her demands just as its weak mother did. In other words, if I yell and shout and stomp and scream, I'll get what I want. And that's the way they enter adulthood. And they're all around us in society. Respect for parents must be maintained for another very equally important reason. Not only because it establishes a child's attitude to any kind of authority, but because if you want your child to accept particularly even Christian values or moral values when he reaches teen years, which we'll deal with next week, then you must parent be worthy of the child's respect in younger years. I spoke about respect for parents one day. I remember it very well at Filey. There must have been, what, 1,500 young people in there at that morning Bible study. I remember them so well, and I was talking about respect for parents, and a girl came up to me afterwards who had been abused by her father when she was a child, and she says, do you expect me to respect that or him? 
Do you really want me to respect my father who abused me when I was a child? You see, to have respect for a parent, then the parent, of course, must earn that respect. When a child can successfully defy his parents during the first 15 years of his life, laughing in their faces and stubbornly resisting and flouting their authority, he develops a natural contempt for them. How often do you hear it? And I used to be a school teacher. How often do you often hear it amongst children? What do they say? They say, well, he promised us an order mark or he promised us detention. And of course, he, he, he wrote it all down, but we knew we could get round him. And he forgot all about it. I used to have a music teacher at Down High. I remember her well. She was a lovely lady and she was as soft as putty. And that the class went wild when she was teaching us. I remember she used to teach us a song called The Campbells Are Coming, Yo-Ho, Yo-Ho. <laughs> and I can hear that class scream, and I'll not do it now, Yo-Ho, Yo-Ho. And the headmaster's class was underneath our particular room, but that didn't seem to worry us at all. And she would say, I'll put you all in detention. I'll put you all in detention. And she wrote down all her names, but she never put anybody in detention that I ever remember because we got round her later, or somebody did. Now, she was a very nice lady, but uh, did people respect her for doing that? Well, no, they just were even worse, weren't they? And the sad thing is, you know, that laughing uh, and flouting authority like that, then eventually you begin to lose respect for the person who says they're going to apply authority, but never apply authority. I want to say this, and it's very serious, because I've seen it happen. The conflict between generations, or what most of you young people here tonight would call the generation gap. The generation gap between you and older people. The conflict between generations occurs because of a breakdown in mutual respect. Mutual respect. And it bears painful consequences. Remember, never, ever as a parent belittle your child or embarrass your child deliberately in front of their friends. When you are punishing them, punish them out of the view of curious eyes and gloating onlookers. Never unmercifully laugh at your child. A sarcastic father, and God knows, sadly, there are too many of them, a sarcastic father may be feared by his children. But remember the little saying, don't mock the alligator until you are across the screen, the stream. Then you can say all you like to the alligator. And you know that little proverb has a lot of truth in it because there are sarcastic fathers bitter and biting against their children and their children fear them. But as soon as their children get out into adulthood, then of course that vicious toothy father may have intimidated his household for a time. But if he doesn't demonstrate respect for its inhabitants, they return the hostility when they reach early adulthood. How often have I seen that? He thinks he is great with his sarcasm. He thinks he's scoring because they are cowered before him and obeying him because they are afraid of him, not because they respect him. And then when they ent enter early adulthood, they despise him and mock him. Don't, says the Bible, don't ever, ever cause your children 
to be angry with you unnecessarily because it's a sad business. Don't provoke your children to wrath. But we're not at that stage yet, that teenage stage, are we? We'll deal with that in detail next week. We are particularly thinking tonight of principles that we should apply when the little toddlers are around us. And remember, the toddler is a tagger. If you think you're tough and strong, you wait until you have a couple of, couple of toddlers. And they have more energy in their little fat fingers than you have got in your whole body. And you may laugh at me, but you'll find out it's true. You will find that they can wear you down, particularly in that 15 to 30 month period. They don't want to be restricted anywhere. They don't want to be inhibited at any time and in any manner. And they're not inclined to conceal their viewpoint. And you will need a very patient hand when you've got little toddlers. They are into everything. They will go out under a 40-ton truck, no bother, if you take your hand away from them. They will disobey you at, at all levels because they're inquisitive. They're beginning to stand on their feet. They're beginning to find their way. They are into the fire even if you don't have a guard up. No, no sense of danger. And a controlling, patient hand you'll need for that little tyrant. But let me, let me console you. I know it looks a lovely, fluffy little beautiful baby when it comes home, but you wait till he hits 15 months and 30 months, and all that comes out. And you say, you will say, like I said, and every parent said, will it never end? Will my hair ever grow again? <laughs> will it ever end? You think it'll never pass. That energy, it's fantastic. At times it can be hilariously funny and good fun, but it is also extremely wearisome. Don't worry, it passes when they're about four. When they're about four. And all I say to you is, if you have twins, cancel all public engagements for two years. <laughs> yes, you know, keep them at home and keep them snug and, and don't disturb them too much. You know, here's the young fella, and he wants to take a baby with him everywhere. Oh, he's going to be different to everybody else. He's going to fly it to Disneyland at 18 months. Oh, boy. He's brought home almost sometimes, you know, in a, in a, in a separate 747 all for himself. The parent who loves her cute little butterball of a child so much that she can't even risk out standing against him, antagonizing him, even when at that stage, you've still got to have that patient, controlling hand. Because even at that stage, they are dead set against breaking all laws put around them. And you say, I don't want to antagonize my child. I don't want to antagonize him. Well, then my friend, if you don't want to antagonize him or her, you may lose and never regain control. Remember that that fiercely energetic time when they are into everything and really going out into all sorts of things and wearing your patience. Just be patient and have that controlling hand when necessary. Easier said than done, I tell you. Secondly, it seems to me that when you are raising toddlers, the best the best opportunity to communicate with them often occurs after punishment. Nothing brings a parent and a child closer together than for the mother or father to win decisively in that battle after they are defiantly challenged. You've got to stand up against defiant challenge. But when you do and you win, then hug your child and continue to show your child that you love your child. This is particularly true if the child was asking for it, knowing full well they deserved what they got. 
And after you have got over that emotional ventilation, the child will want to crumple onto your breast, will want to be with his parent. You should welcome them with open and warm, loving arms. It is very important after you have applied punishment of one kind or another to reaffirm your love for your child. And any parent will tell you that those are often the closest times that a parent and a child is together. You can talk heart to heart, tell them how much you love them and how important they are to you and explain why they were punished and how they can avoid the difficulty the next time. There is certainly a wrong way to correct a child and a major recurring error at this point can make a youngster feel unwanted and insecure and unloved. And one of the best guarantees against that misinterpretation is a loving conclusion to a disciplinary session. Try and remember that. Very important. And when the child puts up its hands with those words and says, love me, dad, love me, mom, you make sure you do, even after that punishment has been given. I often tell about the time my mother, I think she spanked me, and I was so mad, I went into the front room in our house in Newcastle. I got in behind the settee, as we called it in those days. So for you call it now. And I'm in behind it, and I said, I am never going to come out of here again. In 10,000 million years, I'm never coming out of here. And I remember in my tiny little miserable, nasty mind, I was determined I was never going to come out. And I stayed for about 10 minutes, and my mother made me some chips because she knew that that is what I'm very partial to. And I, oh, she made them so nicely, and I can smell them yet wafting through. And I thought, well, maybe 5,000 years, uh, maybe 2,000 years. And I remember going through it all in my little mind and then sneaking out and into the kitchen and up onto a chair and I hugged my mother, said I was sorry and boy, what a tea we had that day. Yeah. It is very important at this stage to also remember another very important thing in this whole area is to control your children without nagging. I think that that is very, very, very important, to control them without nagging. You know, this business that we have sometimes where a parent will say, this is the last time I'm going to tell you, and then that yelling goes on for a long time. Yelling and nagging at children can become a habit, and it's ineffectual one at that. Best, if you are a parent, to control without that nagging. Never underestimate a little child's awareness that he or she is breaking the rules. They know very well when they're breaking the rules. Most children are rather analytical about their defiance of adult authority. If they consider they're going to get off with it in advance, they'll go for it. If they think there may be probable consequences, they'll think about it. And if the odds are too great that justice will triumph, they'll take the safer course. They're not as, as uh, naive as they look. And notice how the youngster will often push one parent to the limits of that parent's tolerance, but it'll be as a sweet little angel to the other parent. And then father whispers, Tom always obeys his mother perfectly, but he won't pay any attention to me. Well, good old Tom has observed that father is an easier push than mother is and has worked that out. So the person uh, who is facing this little toddler, the parent who's facing this little toddler must recognize the most successful techniques of control are those which manipulates something important to the child. Grind him or take away his toys or something which will be important to the child. Just words and words and words and words following, nagging, will not control the child. You know, why don't you do it right, Tom? You know, you hardly ever do it right. 
What am I going to do with you, son? Mercy me, it seems I'm always having to keep on at you, Tom. I can't see why you can't do what you're told. If for once, just for once, Tom, you would act your age. And, you know, it's like a train going by your house every morning and every night. After a while, you never hear it. And they have an inbuilt system that they can just listen to all that. And they, it doesn't matter as long as they don't lose anything by it. Just keep talking, Mum. I don't mind, they're really saying. It's very important that we recognize the most successful techniques of control are those which, which manipulate something important to the child whenever discipline is being brought. Now, could there be anything more relevant than, than the next point, this next very important point? Please, when you are faced with little toddlers in your family, uh, even under five or even over it, don't saturate your child with excessive materialism. Now, you just watch television at the moment, and what happens? You are absolutely seeing a situation where millions of pounds are spent by toy manufacturers on advertising their toys. Those commercials are powerfully skillful on television. They make the toys look so full-size copies of the real thing, and here this little buyer is sitting open-mouthed in front of this tremendous TV advert, absolutely open-mouthed at the thing. And five minutes later, they begin a campaign that will eventually cost his dad a lot of money. Away they go, and what do they do? Uh, well, if not with cash, then with that magic, magic credit card of his. The child will even find that they can ensure that, well, Santa Claus will bring it, won't they? Well, of course, Santa Claus brings toys to everybody, but, but he'll bring me that, won't he? And that can go on ad infinitum. It's very important that when you are, as a parent, seeing your children bombarded with materialism from television, that you resist it with all your heart. Don't be fooled by it. It's not that advertising on television doesn't have its place. Of course it does, but I'm not saying it's immoral, but I'm saying that it's very clever and it knows what it's up to. Watch a child. You just watch a child at Christmas opening a stack of presents. Study it this Christmas when you're at your uncles or your aunts or your friends or wherever and there's a lot of children. Just study them when they're opening presents. And one after another, if they get expensive toys, what do they do? They rip it, throw it aside, and play with a box. Very often. But you know, the child's... You, you take the child's mother in some of these situations. When these expensive toys are, are being opened, the child's mother is made very uneasy by the lack of enthusiasm and appreciation from the child. And this is what a mother will very often say. Oh, Tom, look what it is, Tom. It's a lovely little tape recorder, Tom. Isn't it lovely, Tom? What do you say to your granny for giving it to you? Go and give her a big hug. Isn't it lovely? Did you hear me, Tom? Give your granny a hug. <laughs> give her a big hug and a kiss. You see, the fact is that the child's lack of exuberance results from the fact that the prizes which are won cheaply are of little value, regardless of what it cost his granny or his grandpa didn't cost him anything. So it's cheap. It sounds paradoxical, but you will cheat your children of pleasure when you give to your children too much. You'll cheat them. Pleasure occurs when an intense need is satisfied. And if there's no need, there's no pleasure. A glass of water is worth gold to a dying man of man dying of thirst. And if you never allow your children to want something, they will never enjoy the pleasure of receiving it. As Dobson puts it perfectly, if you 
buy him a tricycle before he can walk, a bicycle before he can ride, a car before he can drive, a diamond ring before he knows the value of money. He accepts these gifts with little pleasure and even less appreciation. How unfortunate that such a child has never actually had a chance to long for something, to dream for something, to even dream about it at night and plot for it by day, and even get so desperate for it, he might even do a little work for it. The same possession that brought a yawn on Christmas afternoon when his relations gave him their presents or whatever could have become a trophy in his life and a treasure in his life. I suggest that you allow your child a thrill of temporary deprivation. It is more fun and it's much less expensive. Talk to Joe Morrow. Joe is the expert on this particular subject on Tuesday nights, as he told you one night when he was giving you his testimony. He went to school in his bare feet because his parents couldn't afford shoes for him. And he has said, I watch young people with their own cars and their own stereos and their own rooms and their own this and that and the other. And he says, I wonder, do they ever get down on their knees at night and thank God for what they've got? because if they had to be brought up in the situation like we were in a great depression, they would appreciate what they've got. That applies to me. That applies to all of us. Let's resist that fierce and awful commercialism and materialism that can invade a little home and a little Christian family and destroy it. Destroy it of fun and of pleasure and of anticipation and of victory and triumph and trophy. Make up your mind, parent, and let me remember it too, that we do not give in to this fierce, 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 fierce pressure. As the famous Bill Cosby said, my name has changed since I've got children. I'm now called Dad Can I. Then the next principle, and these are very important principles, and I appreciate you listening so carefully to those of you who don't have children, and this is down the line, but try and remember it. It's important. Better that you have it now than not think about it, get no teaching on it whatsoever, never hear anything about it, and not be ready for it. Avoid extremes. Please avoid extremes in control and love. There's little question about the consequences of... Uh, Disciplinary extremes, harshness with children, a child suffering humiliation and, and total domination. The child lives in constant fear. You don't want your child living in constant fear. It's not that you never give your child anything. Of course you do, but you keep these principles in mind. And of course, the child lives in constant fear if it has that kind of parent who is abusing it in some way or other, uh, particularly with harshness. And they get hostility and a psychosis later in life, an overbearing oppression. And you, Father, can give your child that psychosis way down the line if you're too harsh with your child and too hard on your child and too bitter with your child. It brings desperate hostility later in life. How many men have I talked to, particularly men whose fathers, you know, always said to them, I, you're not good enough, and I, you're, you can do far better than that, and oh, you're, it gives them this idea that they are a failure, and even in their 30s and 40s, they still have this frightening psychosis that they still haven't pleased their father and haven't come up to the standard of their father. Don't be like that. That harshness. But of course, ultimate permissiveness, letting your children do anything, is equally tragic. That makes the child its own master from babyhood, and he thinks the world revolves around him, and he often has utter contempt and disrespect for those who are closest to him. A balance must be found amongst all of this. 
So let's make some very necessary distinctions then tonight. Let's show that there is a huge difference between abuse of little children and discipline of little children. Abuse tears down a child's spirit and discipline builds it up. Abuse is unfair and extreme and degrading and harsh unduly and unnecessarily long and inappropriate. That's abuse. Discipline is fair. Discipline upholds a child's dignity, is based on justice. There's a difference between abusing a child and disciplining a child. There's a difference between crushing a child and shaping a child. Let's go now to the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, first of all. Proverbs chapter 15. These are lovely little verses that I think will help you. Verse 3. The eyes of the Lord, 15 and 3, are in every place, keeping watch, or 13 rather, a merry heart, rather, makes a, 15 and 13, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. There you have a very vivid contrast between a spirit that's shaped and a spirit that's crushed. You crush a little child's spirit, you crush that spirit, and look what happens. By sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. And you know, many young people, many young people have come to this series and other series whose spirits have been, and counseling has proved it, as I have seen, crushed when they were children. We're talking about discipline tonight, godly discipline. We're not talking about crushing a child's spirit and bringing sorrow of heart when you break that little child's spirit. One translation has that, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face, but when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. May it never be said of me and of you as Christian parents that we have broken the spirit of our children. Chapter 17 of Proverbs, verse number 22, 17 and 22. A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. A broken spirit dries the bones. You know, shaping the will by discipline nurtures a vitality for living. But crushing the will of a little child dries up the vitality of that child and the personality of that child. And it's just like bones drying up. All the vitality gone out of the child's life. And I have often seen that. Little children, they are so sullen and so sad and so unhappy and so miserable because their little spirits have been crushed by parents who are too harsh. And remember, when you're disciplining, there is a vast difference between natural childishness and willful defiance. A child might lose his bike or might leave his father's favorite saw out in the wet or something or forget to feed the dog. Well, that's natural childishness. You be gentle and teach him uh, to do better. But if he fails to respond and doesn't care and is willfully losing things and refusing to do things, then you'll have to have some defining, defining of things and administering some very clear warnings. And he may have to work, for example, to pay for what uh, he has lost or or, uh, be deprived of its use. Childish irresponsibility and willful defiance are two very different things, and they should be handled very patiently. Try and remember what is willful defiance and what is childishness. I mean, my mother was not too hard on me when somebody asked me as a child, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, a missionary home on furlough. (laughs) But it was cheeky. And poor missionaries, when they come home on furlough, they usually work far too hard and don't have a furlough at all, I've discovered. But you see, childishness, all sorts of things can go on there. Chapter 13 of Proverbs, verse 24. Here are some suggestions. 13 and 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Now, there's a bit of discussion about that word promptly. Some say it is careful to discipline him. Some say it means discipline him early. The Hebrew 
background to that word is that it originally meant dawn or early morning. Then it evolved into the idea of pursuing something early in life with determination and diligence. So the association of diligence with discipline indicates that we should start disciplining our children early in their lives. That's very important. Start early in their life, the verse is saying. The longer you wait to begin the process, the more difficult it will become in their lives. Look at chapter 19, verse 18. Here's a lovely little one. 19 and 18. Chasten your son while there is hope. In other words, don't wait until he's a teenager or wait until he's 10 or 9 or 8. Start really early. Chasten your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. So there's a suggestion. Start early and stay balanced. This is very important. Chapter 22, verse 15. Uh, it's good to hear those Bibles opening. 22 and 15. Uh, here's the controversial one for many. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Now there you have, there are two kinds of discipline in Scripture, two kinds of discipline. One is verbal and the other is physical. Now this is the physical one first. Just open your notes for a moment because I've given you some of the arguments here on corporal punishment. Uh, some people say that spanking teach children to hit and hurt other people. If you spank your child, then they'll hit others. They say that corporal punishment is a hostile physical attack by an angry parent whose purpose is to damage and inflict harm on little children. Secondly, they say that spanking is a last resort. You only do it when you really get mad and everything else has failed, so you flail out, the final act of exasperation and frustration. Then, of course, and I got a lot of this at Queen's when I was there, animal psychology. They look at an animal running in a maze and reward it for correct turns in a maze by food, and he learn faster than if he's punished with mild electric shocks. That's not implying that I'm saying you should give your children mild electric shocks. But they're saying that if it hurts them, then uh, they won't learn to do the right thing as quickly as when you reward them. And uh, fourthly, spanking, they say, is damaging to the dignity and self-worth of a child. Well, now, the arguments against that I, I would want to, to lay out before you tonight. Spanking, uh, according to this, uh, using the rods, uh, spanking here in 22 uh, of Proverbs and 15, the rod of correction will drive it far from him is a teaching tool by which harmful behavior is inhibited, not encouraged. Corporal punishment in the hands of a loving parent is altogether different in purpose and practice than a hostile physical attack by an angry parent. Nowhere in the Bible is it saying that parents should thump their children whenever they are angry to get rid of their frustration. No, 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 no. In the hands of a loving parent... It's totally different in purpose. It's effective if it's reserved for use in response to willful defiance. Whenever it occurs, it's much more effective to apply it early in the conflict than until you get mad. Now here you see is an important point. Professionals in this area sometimes have stripped parents of the right to correct children's routine behavior problems while they are of minor irritation. Then when small frustrations accumulate, the parent does not resort to violence. In other words, a short, sharp smack early on in the confrontation is certainly going to be a lot better than going for it when the frustration has boiled over. But professionals say you mustn't do it at all or you mustn't do it early. And they accuse others of saying, our parents of only doing it when they're angry. Well, think the balance of that through. Earlier in the confrontation, I would want to maintain under balance and never, ever, ever hit a child on the head. I think uh, that the buttocks were designed by the Lord for the purpose 
And I remember very well my headmaster flogging me when I was 10. I remember it so well. Boy, was it sore. He gave me six of the best, and I deserved them. I was humiliated. I cried my eyes out. I thought the world had fallen in. And I discovered that I didn't do what I had done again. You're dying to know what it was, aren't you? I never did it again. He and I became the very best of friends. In fact, he used to bring me to his study and give me extra lessons in, in preparing me for exams. He was one of the kindest men I have ever known. When I preached from the Crescent one morning uh, on the radio from the Crescent here, he rang me up or sent me rather one of the loveliest letters I've ever got and said, Derek, I just stood and cried when I listened to you preach. And I thought, dear me, he made me cry and now I'm making him cry. But he was a tremendous man and a wonderful man, and I didn't think any the less of him uh, because he had given me that. I thoroughly deserved it. In fact, it, it really altered my lifestyle. And he did it early before it got a whole lot worse. It wasn't a major wrong thing I had done, but it was something that was wrong, and I deserved it. Now, of course, uh, many will disagree with that, but I certainly find it didn't do me any harm. You see, here's a point that's worth saying, point uh, 2C. If punishment doesn't influence human behavior, as animal psychology would suggest, why does traffic slow down when it spies uh, a policeman? Even Christians slow down whenever they see a policeman. They do. I mean, just get them right up behind with a blue flasher, and they will slow. For some strange reason, Christians will obey the law, even. Yes, if... <laughs> If punishment has no power, then why does a well-deserved spanking turn a sullen little troublemaker into a sweet, loving angel? Yes, rather than being insulted by discipline, a child understands its purpose over his or her own impulses. A child is fully capable of discerning whether his parent is conveying love or hatred. Take this story. Here's a little five-year-old was disobeying in a restaurant, and the lad was cheeking his mother and flipping water at his younger brother, yeah? And deliberately making a nuisance of himself. And after four warnings, which went unheeded, the father took his son by the arm, marched him to the car park, where he proceeded to administer a spanking. And watching this episode was a woman who had followed them out of the restaurant and into the car park. And when the punishment began, she shook her finger at the father and screamed, Leave that boy alone. Let him go. If you don't stop, I'm going to call the police. And the five-year-old, who'd been crying and jumping, immediately stopped yelling and said to his father in surprise, What's wrong with that woman, Dad? <laughs> yeah. He understood the purpose for the discipline, even if the rescuer didn't understand the purpose for the discipline. So I would certainly see there is a place for, for spanking according to the scripture. It's very clear you can't, you can't get away from it. That is a scriptural position. But in the hands of a loving parent, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. And the child understands that purpose. But then go to Proverbs chapter 3 and you get the other compliment. It's not all the rod. In fact, you'll find you'll not have to use the rod very often. If you administer it early and quickly, you'll find that it will very quickly lay the line. And then you can use this approach. My son, 3 and 11, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Notice that. A father will correct the son in whom he delights. The Lord loves you, Christian. And because he loves you, he corrects you. I get corrected by the Lord quite often. There are times I come out of this pulpit and the Lord... Maybe an hour later begins to lay something heavy on my heart that I said that maybe I shouldn't have said or an attitude I had before you or in counseling that was wrong and I have to get, and I'm speaking personally and sincerely, I have to get down before him and, 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 and say I'm sorry. I've seen me even stop the car on University Road on the way home from the Crescent and lift, just stop the car and lift my heart up to the Lord and say I'm sorry because I make mistakes and have wrong attitudes just like, like everybody else. And the Lord corrects you. 
and brings a, a scripture to you and showing you where, where you've been out of line. Well, if the Lord does that to those he loves, and isn't that lovely, Christian, that the Lord delights in you enough to correct you and chasten you. The Lord brings discipline into your life and pressure to bear on you, to bring you down a certain line, to keep you where he wants you. He brings all sorts of things to bear. Circumstances you say, why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? Why am I having to face this? Because the Lord is chastening you. The Lord is drawing you into line. He's putting pressure on you because he delights in you. He delights in you. The Lord delights in you. And because he does, he does that. So it is with a father. He delights in his child. Therefore, he verbally reproves the child. And of course, just you're very patient, 29 and 15 gives you the balance of the two. 29 and 15. 29 and 15. The rod, 29 and 15 of Proverbs, the rod and reproof give wisdom. Verbal reproof, certainly using the rod. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. You leave the child to itself, it will bring shame to its mother. But the rod and reproof. So there you have what we're calling stay balanced. Start early, stay balanced. And be consistent. In other words, don't just, you should never just do it because it's expedient. You should do it consistently, consistently, rather than with expediency. And please be reasonable. As a child grows older, I would think there comes a time when it's inappropriate to use the rod. And if you're not sensitive to this, you'll end up demeaning rather than disciplining your child. So as parents, we are going to have, whether we like it or not, one way or another, a tremendous influence on our children. And I just want to lay this point before you as I close. You've all heard of Jonathan Edwards, the great revivalist in America through whom thousands upon thousands of people were touched and hundreds converted to Christ. Now, Jonathan Edwards was a mighty preacher. Now, listen to this. This is interesting. The father of Jonathan Edwards was a minister, and his mother was the daughter of a clergyman. Among their descendants were 14 presidents of colleges, more than 100 college professors, more than 100 lawyers, 30 judges, 60 physicians, more than 100 clergymen, missionaries, and theology professors, and about 60 authors. There is scarcely any great American industry that has not had one of the Edwards family amongst its chief promoters. Such is the product of one American Christian family reared under the most favorable conditions. The contrast is presented in the Duke's family, which could not be made to study and would not work, and is said to have cost the state of New York one million dollars. Their entire record is one of pauperism and crime and, in, and insanity. Among their 1,200 known descendants, 310 were professional beggars, 440 were physically wrecked by their own wickedness, 60 were habitual thieves, 130 were convicted criminals, 55 were victims of impurity, only 20 learned a tr trade, and 10 of those learned it in a state prison. And this notorious family produced seven murderers. Well, what kind of qualities and what kind of character traits are you and I going to pass down to our children? Are we actively involved in knowing our children, guiding our children towards maturity, teaching them the things of God and the reality of the Christian faith? Or are you passively allowing them to run rampant? Remember, the legacy that you leave will shape your family and will shape Northern Ireland for generations to come. The choice is ours. Let's say it again. As for me and my house, we will. 
by God's grace, serve the Lord. And next week, wait for it, living with teenagers. And if you think toddlers are tough, you wait. Shall we?